Blessings in the name of Jesus, friends, and welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is June the 25th of the year 2017, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now we're going to continue our study on the seven churches of Revelation, and today we are in the seventh and final church. Now in order for us to understand what is taking place in this letter to this church, and understanding that in the time period of the churches throughout the last 2,000 years, how this letter applies to us as well, we need to look at a little bit of background. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 11, and let's begin by reading verse 7 which says, my people are bent to backsliding from me. Now, this is the people from the very beginning of creation to the exact moment that we are in today. So let this statement from the Most High ring in your ears. Again, my people are bent to backsliding from me. Now, with that in mind, turn to Jeremiah chapter 7, and let's read verse 25 and verse 28. Keeping in mind that the passage we just read applies to the people of God throughout time. Jeremiah 7 verse 25, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. And let's go on and read verse 26, Yet they hearken not unto me, or... Yet you have not hearkened unto me, nor inclined your ear, but you have hardened your neck, and you did worse than your fathers. Now verse 28, but you will say unto them, this is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Now let us turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's begin at verse 7, and we're going to read to verse 23. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord God cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. Let me pause here and ask this question. How many secret sins are being committed behind closed doors by those who call themselves followers of the Most High? How many secret things are you guilty of that are not right against the Lord your God? It goes on to say, and they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. So instead of separating themselves, they are conforming themselves to the nations around them. Verse 12, they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law, which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear. But they hardened their necks, like to the neck of their fathers they did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes, and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity, and became vain, and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, and they made them molten images, even two calves, and they made a grove, and they worshipped all the host of heaven, and they served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, 
and they used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and he removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, and he afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he had cast them out of his sight. And so no matter who the Lord sends... No matter what he says, the people are bent toward backsliding. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 5, and let's look at verses 1 to 3. It says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes, or sour grapes, useless grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. So what the Bible is telling us here is that the Lord has planted seed that should produce good grapes. And yet what comes from it isn't good grapes, but sour grapes, grapes that are useless. And this applies to the people whom God has called to serve him throughout time. Now let us look at Isaiah chapter 63 verse 10, which says, but they rebelled and they vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he, the Most High, fought against them. In Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 9, hear what the Lord says. They that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which has departed from me, and with their eyes, which go whoring after their idols. And they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. The Lord's heart is broken over what his people are doing. Jesus echoes this in Luke chapter 13, verse 34, when he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, my people, you killed the prophets. You have stoned them that have been sent unto you. How often I would have gathered the children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Can you hear the brokenness in the spirit of Jesus as he reminds the people that the message has been so clear and so many have come forth to present the message? And yet from the darkness in their hearts and the rebellion in their spirits, rather than heed the message that they have heard, they have killed the messengers. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, that they might turn from their backsliding. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You see, there are many people in churches, even in entire congregations, who are lost. They may be sincere, zealous, and outwardly religious, but they reject the gospel truth. They have all the rich new covenant teachings about Christ's life, death, and resurrection contained in the Bible, yet they choose not to believe nor to obey. And as a result, they are doomed just as Israel was. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, we are told that they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And so just as these problems plagued the people of Israel in their time, so it has moved into the early Christian church. And we see it specifically in the church of Laodicea. So if you would now turn to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Now understand, the church of Laodicea is the last and the worst of all the churches that have been addressed in these letters. Even in Sardis, if you will remember, there were at least some believers that remained. But this church is dead. And it is the only church 
Jesus had nothing good to say about. You see, some churches in these letters have made the Lord weep. Some have made him angry. But this church makes him sick. And so let's begin by reading the letter, and then we will come back and we will discuss it. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Now unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now let's begin back in verse 14 as the Lord presents himself first as the Amen. He says, these things saith the Amen. What does that signify? The word in Hebrew simply means truth. So he says, these things saith the truth. Now we know that Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. But he also said in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. And we know from John chapter 1 that Jesus is the living word. And so he's representing himself here as the word of God. You see, all the Old Testament promises of forgiveness, mercy, loving kindness, grace, hope, and eternal life are bound up in Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises, covenants, and prophecies. He says that he is the faithful and true witness, meaning that he is completely trustworthy, perfectly accurate, and his testimony is always reliable. We can place all of our trust upon him. And finally, he says he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, this is important because in the surrounding region of Laodicea, People were teaching that Jesus had been created by God. And this denounced, of course, that he is God. And the people who perpetuated this claimed to have a secret, higher knowledge above and beyond the simple words of Scripture. And this is why Paul writes in his letter to Colossae, which was very close to Laodicea in proximity, and therefore were hearing the same false teachings. And Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him, Jesus, were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And so Jesus, by taking this title, the beginning of the creation of God, is denouncing this message that is being presented among this Laodicean church. And he goes on in verse 15, he says, I know your works. Now, unlike the other churches, there's nothing good about their works. Because he says that you're neither cold, you're not a sinner, pagan in your beliefs and practices, and you're not hot, you're not on fire for me. I wish you were cold or hot. Why? Because if you were cold, you would receive judgment. If you were hot, you would receive reward. But because you are lukewarm, you are a hypocrite. You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. And because of this, I will spew you out of my mouth. 
In the Greek, that means vomit. I will vomit you out of my mouth. And in a modern way of saying it, he's saying you make me sick. Now, this is the great and good God, full of mercy and compassion, kindness and patience. And yet he says to these people, you turn my stomach. Now, in remembering and realizing that this message applies to the church today that we live in, many of the churches, pastors, and teachers that exist today and are teaching people worldwide literally make him sick. And so when you see these things on TV, when you hear these things on the internet that these people are teaching, if it turns your stomach, think of what it does to the Lord. Because the only reason it moves you in such a negative way is that you have the spirit of the Lord. And if that's what it does to you on a small scale, think of what it does to the Most High. Well, it goes on in verse 17 and he says, Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and you have need of nothing, Yet you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so what Jesus is warning against here is don't think just because you have so many material things that you're blessed with a good job, a good family, a roof over your head and food in your stomach. Don't equate these things to God's view of you. Because the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, which Jesus also said, that the Most High pours His blessings out upon the just and the unjust. So the blessings we receive in this life are no indication of our relationship to Him. And yet that's what he's saying of this church. He's saying, look, you think that because you have so many blessings in your life that you have found favor with me. And so you see yourself in your own goodness. But the way I see you, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I would counsel you, I would encourage you to buy gold from me that has been tried in the fire. Remember what Peter told us in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying here, repent, and that fire will be bestowed upon you. He says, then you will be rich. And you will wear white raiment, spotless, unstained, and untainted from the sin of this world. And you will be clothed that the shame of your nakedness will not appear. Why? Because we have been clothed in his righteousness. And anoint your blinded eyes with eye salve so that you may see. And so he pauses for a moment in verse 19 and he says, Look, I know this rebuke is strong and harsh and may be difficult to hear. But as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I'm rebuking you in this letter because I love you. But if you continue in your wicked, evil ways, I will cut you off from my love. So he says, be zealous, be eager to repent. Now in verse 20, this is a passage that has been misused in so many ways in evangelistic efforts. And it's not what it's saying at all. So let's read it together and then let's look at it. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, will sup with him, and he with me. Now, this isn't about Jesus standing at the door of your heart knocking, wanting to come in. Jesus is saying here, I was in your church at one time. I was among your fellowship. But because of your sinful practices, I had to leave. I had to depart. And you have shut the door on me, leaving me outside. And you think that all you're doing inside is in my name and bringing pleasure to me. But I am on the outside knocking, asking you to let me back in. Let me be the center of your preaching. Let me be the center of your teaching. Let me be the center of your music. And yet everything you do is about you, not about me. He says in verse 21, if you heed this message and you overcome, I will grant you to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. In other words, you will reign with me throughout eternity. You will not be cast into outer darkness. You will not suffer the flames and the torture of hell. You will not live where the worm never dies. 
But just as I sit in the presence of my Father, so too shall you. But you must be zealous and repent. And then he finishes with verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear with the Spirit, saith unto the churches. Friends, if ever there was a time that the church of the living God, the body of the living God, the people of the living God needed to hear this letter, this message, it's today. So many are sitting under the teachings of men like Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, Joyce Meyer, Paula White, and as Paul told the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, For many walk whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, because they mind earthly things. And so, friends, we must come out from among them. We must be separate. We must get back to the word of God, and flee the doctrine of men. We must get back on our knees and humble ourselves until the fire of God consumes us and recognize the hypocrisy that has been so much a part of us for so long. We must be sincere in obeying the things of God no matter how much pain or what the cost to us. Friends, that's the message of this letter. Now let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I love you, friends. I truly hope and pray that you find a quiet place today to stop, to think on the things of your Lord, your God, and your King, and to consider this last letter to this church and if it applies to you today. Oh, friend, if it does, fall on your face in repentance before him because he is faithful and just to forgive you in the sincerity of your heart as you repent of your sin. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.